Amen. Thank you, brother. Um, before I get to the sermon, I just want to thank you, Steve, for bringing up 9-11. Uh, hmm. Didn't expect that. Let me just explain. Uh, I was raised in New York City, and uh, I loved the World Trade Center. Isn't that a silly thing to say? I, it was a, a place that I used to argue with my father about, and he just hated new architecture, and I loved it. To me, it was like the gleaming center of everything that was beautiful about my home city. <clears throat> and when I was in college, I, uh, I used to go to NYU, and I went to night school, and I used to, during the daytime, manage a liquor store under the World Trade Center. Uh, so it was weirdly personal for me when it, I still haven't been able to go back uh, to the memorial. And I've been thinking about it a lot. I mean, it really hurt for a lot of us who can remember that. And I, as I thought about it, I'm so grateful to the Lord that in the midst of this evil, this picture of gratuitous, awful evil, that befell our nation on that day, and all of the trauma <clears throat> since that time, how great, how overwhelming, how much more is the love of God. And we can give thanks for that. We give thanks for his promises that the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. And I, for one, am glad about that. Amen. Amen. Would you turn in your Bibles to Matthew 12? We're going to be picking up uh, where we sort of left off last time at Matthew 12, starting at verse 1. And while you turn there, don't worry, I'm, I'm going to read a verse while you're probably still looking, but it's this famous verse that I want to pull out here. Uh, at the very end in verse 8, it says, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And in the parallel passage in, in Mark, it's even clearer. It says this, and Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Okay. A lot of times we hear this passage, right? And we think, and in several passages like it, we start thinking, well, the Lord is just coming against the Pharisees and all these legalists who are all uptight about following the law and all these kind of things. And Jesus comes along setting it all right, and you don't have to do any of that stuff. That is not the teaching of this passage. All right? If I just want to repeat the biggest sort of lesson of Matthew that we've been coming to here. There's this idea sometimes that we want to put aside. We want to take this terrible idea I'm about to speak about and take it down and sort of stamp on it. Right? This terrible idea that separates God the Father from God the Son that separates them into some sort of idea where God the Father is the Old Testament God, and he's angry, and he sets up these laws which were impossible, and everybody hated them. And then along comes the New Testament God, Jesus, somehow saving us from this angry Old Testament God. And Jesus is the nice guy. It's the good cop, bad cop kind of a thing. And Jesus doesn't worry about all that stuff. That is not the teaching of Scripture. If there's any part of your heart that thinks that, put it aside! <laughs> The lesson of Scripture is that God the Father and God the Son are perfectly aligned. That that Old Testament God, you know when you read Leviticus and all that stuff about all the sacrifices and the unutterable holiness of God? That is the same God we're worshiping today. God didn't change. And I want you to think about that. Think about the immensity of what it was like to worship God in Israel, where you came in and you couldn't draw into the presence of God without blood. Without an animal dying in your place. Why? Because of what he'd said to Adam, you shall surely die. The unutterable holiness of God has not gone away. That is the God we're worshiping this morning. The difference is because Jesus has stood in our place. The difference is because Jesus came into the world and did this thing that has redeemed us. Because of Jesus, we have access to God this morning, but nothing has changed. Outside of Christ, God the Father is a consuming fire, and sin cannot stand in his presence. Do we understand this? When we understand this, it helps us to understand this passage. Jesus didn't come into the world to undermine all that God said in the Old Testament. Jesus came into the world in a deep way to help us understand far more deeply what the Old Testament's all about. And today, we're going to talk about my favorite commandment. Jules has a favorite commandment? Sure I do. I just came back from vacation. The fourth commandment, rest. For some reason, if you think about it, think about the Ten Commandments. If we think about them as binding at all on us, I, so often Christians will look at the Ten Commandments as just a sort of laundry list of stuff for kids. I tell you it's not. 
It's actually a summary of the moral law of God. It's a very, very profound list of guidelines for us as human beings. There's one of these, remember Sesame Street? I think it was Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> All of these laws kind of make sense, except for one in a way. All of them kind of like, if you want to have a functioning society, you have to honor your parents. It's just one of those things. You don't kill each other. You keep your promises. You, you don't steal. You don't lie. These are just kind of, it's common sense. But this one, the fourth commandment about rest, that do, surely that doesn't rise to the level of moral law. I mean, rest, is it that serious? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Well, Jesus hates the rest, doesn't he? He says, no. To the contrary, he establishes it. The principle of the Sabbath is not less in Jesus, it's more. And I want to talk about that today. I want to think, I want you to leave today's service with a, a sense of renewed zeal for what it means to rest. In a society that's committed to restlessness, we're almost, it's almost obscene, actually, the extent to which we have this phobia about anything rest. You know how that phrase about how nature abhors a vacuum? Modern society abhors the concept of rest because it's a type of vacuum. It's like, what are you doing? Nothing. You can't do nothing, <laughs> right? Have you ever tried to ease out a little bit of time where you're doing nothing and you feel guilty? I spent the last two few weeks struggling with guilt constantly. I'm insane, but I hope I'm not alone in this. God is telling us something wonderful, and it's not just a, a guideline. It's actually a commandment. And it's not just an Old Testament thing. It applies to us. Amen? All right. Let's, let's read the passage together. Now you should be there. So it's Matthew 12, starting at verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Amen. Thanks be to God. So I want to go over the fourth commandment, shall we? What's the fourth commandment? Does anyone uh, remember it from memory? I won't torture you with this. The fourth commandment is what? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, it says. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy visitor that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And the seventh day he rested. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Hey, that's pretty good. I memorized it. All right. That's a lot. Did you notice anything interesting about this? There's a couple of interesting things. Number one, the placement of it, the fourth commandment. I want to talk about this for a second. I've mentioned in, this in the past, but I think it's really interesting. The more I've walked as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more impressed I am that it's not an arbitrary thing, that it's the fourth commandment and not, let's say, the ninth commandment or tenth commandment. Why is it there? Now, think about this for a second. The first three commandments, there's like a triad. That's an important theological number, three, right, for Christians. There's three commandments that are directed to God. We can call these the vertical commandments. Those first three commandments, you remember the first one? It's like you're to have no other gods before you. You're to know and acknowledge God to be the only true God. You're to worship and glorify him alone. Number two, you're to worship that only true God the way he tells you to worship him, and not in any other way, not by idols, not any other way you make up. And number three, you are not to take his name in vain, meaning not just the things you say, but the things you do in your life. You are to glorify God. All these things make a powerful combination of stuff. This is what you're to do for God. Three commandments. And then the end... The whole rest of the set from the five on to ten, it's clearly for one another. You're to honor your parents. You're not to kill. You're to keep your vows in marriage, right? No adultery. You're to not steal. You're to tell the truth. You're to, not, you're to be generous and not to be covetous, okay? All of that stuff is for one another, human level. But then you have the fourth commandment, which is this interesting pivot. 
that on the one hand deals with God and on the other hand deals with one another, right? We tend to focus more on how it deals with God, but I want to focus on this other way. Think about it. The fourth commandment, when you look at it this way, you have three commandments that are devoted to God, directed to him, and then seven, ooh, that's an interesting number too, three commandments to God, seven commandments to one another. What's the first and foundational commandment then that God sets for how we relate to one another? Rest. Now, that's interesting to me. Why that? Here's another interesting thing. When God begins going through the law, after he gets to, uh, through with giving you the Ten Commandments, in Exodus 21, the part where everyone stops reading Exodus and they skip on to something else, when was the last time you read Exodus 21? You should. It's fascinating. The first thing God talks about in Exodus 21 is rules about slavery, which seems weird. As Christians, we get all uncomfortable with that. But what it's about, this is interesting, has to do with rest. Rest. In other words, what God is saying is, you Hebrews, when you were in Egypt, you were given no rest. They made you slaves. They degraded you. You never got a day off. You, when you come into the land that I'm giving you, are not going to treat people this way. The first and foundational commandment is a matter of social justice, not just you. And by the way, not just you. I'm not telling you, the rich people, to take the day off and to be sipping pina coladas, getting caught in the rain, right? <laughs> While, let's say, the foreign uh, worker serves me and I don't even notice him. You know, everything's fine. I'm sipping pina coladas and, and I'm resting. It's like, actually, that's not what God said. Because this is the second thing. Not just you rest, but also your children. And not just your children, but your servants. And not just your servants, but your cattle. That's weird. And not just your cattle, but this gets to the real point. Even the visitors within your gates, everyone. There will be no one who will be forced to work. We treat this law as some sort of thing. It's like, oh, what a burden. What a burden. It's, it's so inconvenient. But what God is saying is, actually, there's a whole different way of thinking about this. Imagine a whole society that is resting at the same time. How unutterably just that is. Huh. Interesting. How backwards it is that we look at the idea of rest as a sort of burden for us. All right? Now we remember in the Old Testament what Jeremiah says. He says, if you don't listen to me to keep the Sabbath day holy and not to bear a burden and enter by the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I'll kindle, a file, I'll kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it won't be quenched. In other words, this isn't just recommended guidelines. I'm not just sort of suggesting this. Maybe you want to consider following the Sabbath. In the Old Testament, you had to follow the Sabbath rules, right? Or else. What else do we find out about the Sabbath in the Old Testament? As you know, it's not just every week, every seven days was a rest, but what? There's another thing. It's not just every seven days, but every seven years is a rest. This idea of the Sabbath rest, the land itself is given rest. And then there's even one more level, right? Every seventh, what is it? Every 50th year, basically, every seven, seven years, there's a jubilee year. Oh, man. Have you ever thought about studying biblical economics? I now digress, and I'm sorry for this, but biblical economics are so weird when you think about it. It's this straight, how do we fit in? Is it Democratic or Republican? It's, I honestly don't know. It's neither. It's this interesting, weird hybrid of like, there's all this kind of, it looks kind of capitalist, but then all of a sudden, every 50 years, there's this massive reset, right? And we'll have to discuss this sometime. I digress. But it's fascinating. The idea of three sevens, there's every week you rest, every seven years you rest, every 50 years. I think rest matters to God. It's a huge and important theme. For the, when the Jews went into exile, what did God say about them? What did God say? He says in Leviticus 26, having warned them, I will scatter you among the nations and unsheave the sword after you and your land shall be a desolation. Your cities shall be a waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate while you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall have rest. The rest it did not have on your Sabbaths when you were dwelling in it. It's interesting. Do you remember at the beginning of the COVID epidemic, pandemic, last, well, when was it? It's a long time ago now. It was March, right? Do you remember that strange feeling, something none of us had ever seen in our lifetime of the entire society shutting down? 
I wanted to be careful about making this point because I don't want to be seen at all to be belittling it. There was a lot of pain and, and like depression and all kinds of bad stuff going on at that time. I'm not trying to belittle it, but I'm trying to say one interesting thing that you may have noticed, kind of, dare I say, refreshing. <laughs> it was weird. It was like, did any of you drive during that time? I had this ability, I was driving at that time, and it was so weird being on 95 and not seeing any cars at all, anywhere, in front of you. I've always dreamed about that. What would it be like to drive on a highway and see no one? And I did, for a while. It was so cool, I actually took pictures. It was probably against the law to do this, but I was taking pictures. There's no one in front of me, no one behind me. A strange thing for a society to stop running, especially ours, which isn't designed that way. And there's something where God is saying, you know, this is important sometimes. You need to rest. It's not just a recommendation. It's actually kind of important. All right, now I say all this to you to say the Jews took this very seriously and in, in all integrity were trying to obey the law. And as they did so, you're probably familiar with this, came up with all sorts of regulations, like hedging the Torah is what it's called. We want to make sure that you're not going to break the law. So what we're going to do is sort of add to it. We're going to add this little permit around here so that even if you stumble on that, you won't be breaking the law. And you keep adding to it and adding to it so that, and what's the problem with that? Isn't that a good thing? It actually is rooted. I'm trying to obey God, right? The problem is it's starting from this assumption that's asking maybe the wrong question. And it's saying, how far do I have to go? Like, how exactly do I do this? In other words, the implicit question is, what do I not have to do? How far can I go and then no further? And it's this question of lines. Are you guys familiar with this concept of the Eruv? The E-R-U-V, it's this Jewish idea of the Eruv, and it's interesting, fascinating. Gentiles know nothing about this, but the entire island of Manhattan is one big Eruv, and that is, it's, a, it's this word that means it's a zone, a rabbinic zone. Let me explain. The whole island of Manhattan is surrounded, literally, by a sort of a fishing line. And that fishing line, it sets up a rule, a perimeter. Okay, so the rule is, as you may know, you're not allowed to carry things on the Sabbath if you're an Orthodox Jew. Why? Because it's work, right? But that includes just keys. It includes your pocketbook. It includes a baby stroller. It includes your baby. After all, you're trying not to work, and so you can't carry your keys. You can carry it in the house, but as soon as you leave your house, what? You're in public space, and now you're working. Do you get it? Does that seem silly, maybe? I'm not trying to make fun of anything. There is a sense where it's like, I get it. You're trying to obey the Lord, and you're trying to draw a line. But we know somehow something silly about this. What do you mean I can't carry my keys? It's New York City, right? I need my keys. Well... So we come up with this thing called the Eruv, where it's like it turns as long as it's surrounded by this and has a rabbinic blessing. Now the whole island of Manhattan is sort of semi-private space. So now you can carry it more than the rule is four cubits. Are you ready for a test? I want to see how, who knows out here. How far is four cubits? <laughs> come on, guys. Let's be biblical. Yes? Yes! Very good, Elizabeth. 18 inches is a cubit, and so, as we all know, four cubits is six feet. I just want to say this is serious. You can't carry something, including keys, on the Sabbath, if you're Orthodox Jewish, more than six feet in a public space, or you'll be violating the law. You can look a long time in Leviticus and say, what? I don't see where you got this. Well, it's derived. See the problem? What's the problem? It's the definition of legalism, and Jesus doesn't like it at all. Let me talk about what legal, legalism, everybody uses this word as if every time you follow God's way, that's legalism. That's not legalism. Legalism is when we add to God's word what he didn't choose to add. Let me give you the Presbyterian version of it. Did you know in the old days in Presbyterianism, you couldn't be a Presbyterian, you couldn't become a member of the church without signing a, a covenant saying, I will not drink. Let me just say that that is legalism. It's the very picture of it. Jules, are you saying it's okay to drink and get drunk all the day? No such thing. That's not what I'm saying. We want to be wise about this. But you can't just sit there and add something to God's word that he didn't put there himself. We presume to be holier than God. That's legalism. What's the opposite of legalism? I would say that's the besetting sin of our culture. The opposite of legalism is where we presume to subtract from God's word. Well, he didn't really mean this. Where we presume to be more loving than God. 
right? And the message of Scripture is, you have no right, this is my word, saith the Lord. I've given you this that you may live. You can't add to it, you can't subtract to it. Amen. This is what Jesus gets at. By the way, do you remember the guy at the pool in Bethesda in Jerusalem, John 5? There's a man who's been sitting at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. 38 years sitting there at the pool. And he's, he's you know, I won't get into the whole story, but he, he's just kind of lame and he hasn't been able to be healed. And Jesus comes along and heals him. Amazingly, it's on the Sabbath. And he, what is, do you remember what he says to him? Rise, get up. Take up your mat. Now, I want you to hear this. And come, we, we were just talking about this whole issue. Take up your mat and walk. Only walk six feet. And then you better stop because the rabbis will be mad. No, Jesus set this up on purpose, I dare say. Take up your mat and walk. Should I go over the six foot? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> he takes that step. And are the rabbis happy about it? Are the Pharisees happy about the fact that he's healed? No, we are incensed. What are you doing? You're having him violate the Sabbath. Did you just see a healing of a man who's been here 38 years? Yes, but you're, I can't stand what I just saw. And what is Jesus saying? You are seriously going to stop me from bringing the healing of God to this man, but you could have waited till tomorrow to do it. And Jesus is like, no, I won't. Why? Because mercy demands it now. Because this is what the Sabbath is about. I am bringing healing today. Not tomorrow for laws that God never even made up. Got it? This is important. It gets to the heart of the Sabbath. What's the Sabbath about? It's about rest. And what Jesus is showing us, it's not just about us resting and coming up with a million workarounds to show how we're resting when we're really not. It's about bringing rest to others. The rest of God. Amen. <laughs> So Jesus, far from saying that, that Sabbath doesn't matter, in fact, I would like to establish here, he's saying the opposite. So there you have it in the beginning. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry. They began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath. What's wrong with what they were doing? I mean, they're just walking through the fields and they're picking stuff. What's wrong with it? You're working. You know what else is illegal? By the way, I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood, so I know this stuff. It's just so interesting, right? You can't start a, start a stove if you're Orthodox Jewish on, on the Sabbath. Again, I'm not making fun of it. It's just these rules that end up as a, a kind of cage around you. Why can't you start a stove? That seems silly. Just turn the button. That's work. Why? Well, starting a fire used to be a lot of work, so it's the principle of it. And yet, in the end, it's absurd. <laughs> You can't touch the elevator button. because you, And so what they would do is hire guys like me, <laughs> the goy boy, to come in and you press the button or you turn on the stove and, and all these kind of things. And it seems a little, what were the disciples doing so bad? They're reaping. You're working. No, I'm just picking stuff and eating it. No, no. And then the parallel passage in Luke makes it really funny. Not only are they plucking the heads of grain, but does anyone remember what they're doing there? They're also doing this. They're rubbing it in their hand. You don't want to just eat the thing. So they're rubbing it, and they're, they're getting the seeds out, right? You're eating the kernels. You're winnowing and reaping. Oi! <laughs> right? <laughs> this is terrible. You're clearly working. <laughs> now, Jesus could have addressed this issue of that you're adding to the law, but he goes actually to the heart of the matter, and this is where it gets interesting. This is what he says. He says to them, have you not read, to the Pharisees, <laughs> have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for them to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Remember, in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, in the temple, they would have the bread of the presence, presence bread that was set up there in the temple each week that only the priests would eat. David comes in and is hungry and is allowed to eat it. Why? Big reason. It's going to sound too simple to be satisfying, but here it is need. He was hungry. He was in need. This is a very important principle. The principle of scripture is that this is a work of necessity. If someone is hungry, the ceremonial law has to be set aside. 
I want to tell you this hilarious story, and unfortunately it's true. And I think it was at Princeton Seminary. This is an old story, but a true story. One of the teachers had this sort of moral test on a student. So I'm kind of, I feel bad about this for the students who failed it, and I feel I would have done so too. Here was the moral test. It was like the teacher was about to preach on the story of the Good Samaritan. And it was this chapel that you had to show up at. And there was, it was this whole setup where it was like they were going to be late if they didn't make it there on time. And on the way, it was set up so that there was this guy lying in the road, <laughs> right? And he's lying there in need. And wouldn't you know that every one of the seminarians saw the guy and like ran by to get to class. Isn't that interesting? How many times do we do that in our life? Right? We run past this because this is really important. You understand. Someone else can deal with this. And what, what the scripture is saying is, no, this actually is more important this need is more important, that works of necessity are actually more important, that when David was hungry, so this, the disciples' hunger is actually, remember where they just came back, they'd just been on their first mission tour, right? And they're coming back, they're hungry and tired, they, they need some R&R. &R. That's not all Jesus is saying, though. He's also pointing out that who was it who did this? It was David. David, the anointed one of God, had need. And that's more than your regular person. And who's Jesus but the anointed one, the holy one of Israel, the son of David? Do you remember what Jesus said to the woman at the well? If you knew who was talking to you, you'd ask for more of this water. And it's almost like Jesus is saying this here. If you knew who is before you now, you wouldn't be questioning this thing. Do you know who's before you? This is the Lord in your presence, the Lord of the Sabbath. And he's here with his warrior band bringing the kingdom of God on earth, doing the work of God. Brothers and sisters, I want you to see yourselves as this. You are holy to God. We are here about the business of God. We come to church because we're hungry and because we're doing the work of God. Jesus goes on then, and he kind of makes this point. Or, he says the second one, have you not read in the law how, the Sabbath, how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? What does that mean? On the Sabbath, in other words, the priests are working, of course. Like me, today, I'm working here. I guess this is work. <laughs> the weirdest thing about being a pastor is I never know the line between work. And I, I, I see someone for lunch, and I'm eating, and I'm enjoying myself. It's like, am I working right now? <laughs> it's funny. I'm kind of jealous of myself. <laughs> I, I'll admit it. Not everything is perfect about this job, but it has its good things. I don't think of this as work right now. But apparently it is. I'm not profaning the Sabbath in any way, and nor were the priests who were tending the temple. Why? Here's the second big point. Because they're being about the work of the God, about God. Now, these are the two things. It sounds too simplistic, but it's important. Works of necessity. When there's need, when there's need, it's the job of the church to recognize that, and that supersedes issues of ceremonial law. That's number one. And number two, it's kind of like when we're about the business of God, that too supersedes certain fastidious observance. It's interesting, I'll just note this in passing, that Jesus first brought up David, who's the king, and here he brings up the temple, which has to do with priests. Isn't that cool? Uh, we'll talk about this next time, but do you remember how Jesus is, is like called a priest in the order of Melchizedek? Melchizedek, who shows up in Hebrews 7. And why is Jesus a priest in the order of Melchizedek? He's not descended from Aaron. And it's like it's true. He's not, he's not by bodily descent, but why is he a priest? By the power of indestructible life. Woo! We'll talk about that next time. I can't wait. Matthew 6 to 8. Let's finish our passage. It says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you'd known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Here's this whole point. It's like he's the Son of Man. He's the, he's, the, he's the authority of God. He's the Messiah. He's in your presence. Something greater than the temple is here. Again, a hint for next time. But this, this idea, this word, something greater than the temple is here. Next time, in the next passage, he's going to say something greater than Jonah is here. And then he's going to say something greater than Solomon is here. Do you notice anything interesting about that? Just let me say, Solomon, Jonah, the temple. Solomon, Jonah, the temple. Something greater than each of these. Something greater than Solomon, the greatest of the kings, right? Something great. Here's this king greater than Solomon. Whew. Jonah, something greater than that prophet. The temple where the priests are. Here's something greater than any of the priests. Prophet, priest, king. <laughs> 
wait until next week. This is going to be awesome. But I, I digress again. All right. Last thing I want to talk about is this. Did you notice what Jesus says there? If you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. It's the second time Jesus has said this in Matthew, and it's important. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. These words from Hosea. The last time he said this was in Matthew 9, and he's been being pressed by the Pharisees. They're looking at the, why, do you, why are you eating with the tax collectors and sinners? Remember? What did Jesus say there? He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. On this vacation that I had, I feel slightly guilty about this. Because I know that I should have spent the entire time thinking diligently about the church schedule for the fall. I should have sat there and thinking, oh, this and that. I didn't. Lord, help me. I didn't even think about it at all. I did, however, spend the entire time. I'm, I'm actually thrilled with this. I spent the whole time sort of deep in God's word. I was thinking about the Psalms and I was thinking about Matthew and rereading this book. And I had this one remarkable, beautiful vision that I just wanted to share with you on this. It had to do with, in a sense, my life. For this, say, Matthew 9, after he says this, do you remember Jesus talks to them and he's like, you know, you, you can't, you don't want to fit a patch to some unshrunk cloth. Have you remember this one? It's an interesting thought there, and it makes sense. You don't want to take this patch and stick it on unshrunk cloth, because as soon as you wash it, the cloth, is, it's just going to mess everything up. You're going to tear the cloth, right? It's, it's bad. So what, what I started thinking about, I could explain this to you from the, the theology of it. It's like, okay, here's what this means, and it's saying that the old forms, you know, in the new, in the New Testament, in the old, I'm not going there right now, because I took this personally. And as I was thinking about it, I realized a sense of gratitude. Lord, I'm so glad... When I first came to the church, I was like this untested cloth. Or I was like this. I came into the church and I was completely not ready for the kingdom of God. I had no idea what it meant about your holiness. I had no idea what it meant to follow God. And if I had been asked to follow God, if I had to pass all these tests, if I had to be a mature Christian just to have fellowship with God, I'd still be waiting on the outside. But thanks be to God for his grace, I was allowed as some child, basically, to come into the presence of God. When I was a kid, I had a very, very dysfunctional childhood, all right? And a lot of us did. A lot of us did here. And the thing that makes me so, it's so beautiful beyond measure, I'm so grateful to God that he gave me this chance that, like, a new innocence, at the age of 29 years old, I was able to come into the presence of God and be innocent in his sight and enjoy a time of childhood where it's almost like I could, figuratively speaking, run around like a child in the presence of my Heavenly Father. Enjoy! Enjoy! With no fear! Totally accepted! And over the years, as I've walked with the Lord, this amazing thing has been happening where you walk with Him and you begin to be aware of it, at first on the side, but more and more. More and more as you realize the greatness of your God. The greatness and the holiness of the living and true God that I serve. And you begin to sort of take the knee. And you begin to say, wow. And actually, if you've had this experience of abiding in the holiness of God all of a sudden, at first it's exhilarating, and then maybe there's almost this fear that comes in. Like, what have I been doing? been running around like a fool in the presence of the king and right then is where he bids you now stand up in my sight my child you are loved now walk walk in the way I'm showing you and follow me this is beautiful this is the vision for our church when we reach out to people we're not looking for people that are already Christian <laughs> to come into the church. You can look a long time. Oh, people do all the time, and all that is is church shifting, right? People do that all the time. I'm not, that's what people do. But the thing is, people who don't know the Lord, surprise, surprise, they don't look like Christians. I didn't. And then you think of the beauty of grace. It's why Jesus came. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. What does that mean? It means we take people who have not been tested, who have been in various ways broken and hurt by the world, who themselves have broken and hurt others, who are not worthy of the gospel, not one bit, 
and we invite them into the presence of God their Father that they can worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness and then can have this renewal and this season of innocence and can run as children free in the presence of God their Father and slowly, slowly over time come to realize the greatness and the holiness of their God. Amen. Let that be the mission of this church. This is what the Sabbath is all about. This is what the Sabbath is all about. It's not some fastidious thing about, you know, following this or that rule. It's not an When we follow the Lord, the question is not how far do I have to go and no further. That's just the wrong question. And it's always going to lead to wrong answers. Well, you can carry your keys, but not five keys. It's absurd. What are you talking about? This is not what scripture is about. Are you? <laughs> this is not what the scripture is about, right? How much and no further. What the question is, is what glorifies God? How shall I glorify you when you abide in the presence of the king? And here's the vision for the church. What a blessing it is to abide together on the Sabbath. What a blessing it is. The Jesus didn't get rid of the Sabbath. Rather, he deepens it and establishes the Sabbath. Rather, today is a day where we gather as God's people in his presence. I want to give you a vision of the church. Wouldn't it be neat if kind of a thing? All right. I'm not giving this for, to you for legalism, but it's this idea. Here we are. And we gather in the morning to learn God's word. And then we worship. We abide in his presence for a time. And then after that, I saw this at a Korean church I was at, and I was like jealous because afterwards we had Korean food long into the afternoon, eating, eating. It was glorious, <laughs> right? I mean, I loved it. It was food and fellowship long into the afternoon. And then at the end of it all, people were like, then we sang and prayed, and that wrapped up the day. And you might be thinking, wow, that's a lot of stuff because I'm busy the rest of the week. But no, think about this. In God's interesting economy, you have all this time with your people. You have all your friendship. You have all of this wonderful day, and it kind of clears out your schedule for the rest of the week to labor and do the work you need to do. Why am I sharing this with you? Not to burden you with legalism. Oh, this is what we're going to do at this church. But rather just to give you a vision of maybe something beautiful. And then imagine a society where all the churches do that and how that would change the society. And then imagine a society where the whole thing stops and every human being and every creature of God is given rest on this day, the rest that is their right as God's creatures. That's a beautiful vision of what the church is about. So let's do that. Let's bring the rest of God. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen? I feel so guilty. I've just done another long sermon. I said, this time I'm going to come back from this vacation and not do it. This is the last time. <laughs> Hilarious. Let's, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of your word, for the life that it brings to us. Lord, we look to you and, and are reminded of your promises to us in your word. You call us to rest, and somehow in our absurd sinfulness, we fight against it and call it a burden. Heavenly Father, help us to stop looking at your wisdom as if it's some burden for us, but rather to trust you enough to see that you're showing us the way of life, that you're, the unfolding of your words gives light, and that your word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. And Heavenly Father, as we abide in your presence, that as we walk in that way that you have called us to walk, as we do so humbly and courageously, that we know that no shame will come to us, not in a real way, not where we follow you. So Heavenly Father, bless us as we seek to follow you and glorify you today and always as your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.